Yo, what's up guys? Alpha, and today I'm going to be doing a full in-depth deck breakdown of a deck that I recently used to go 34 and 11 with across five of the new Explorer Constructed events on Arena. And now before I get into it, there's going to be an MTGA zone link down in the description. If you click on that, it'll have the deck list there that you can just import into Arena if you want to try the deck out for yourself. Uh, and I'm also in the process of writing a full text article about this deck that will have a lot more detail as well as all of the combo loops written up there that you can check for reference. So once that's finished, I'll link it down in the description, you can check it out if you're interested. Uh, so anyway, with that all out of the way, this is my best of one Simic Paradox Engine combo in Explorer. Now Paradox Engine combo is one of my favourite decks, I really really enjoyed playing this sort of deck when it was viable in Historic uh, about a year or so ago, and so I'm really excited to try it out in Explorer. So the first thing I want to quickly address is why I'm running this in best of one rather than best of three. Uh, this is absolutely a deck you can run in best of three, but it has two main issues that a lot of other best of three decks don't have. First of all, Khan the Great Creator is a really important part of this deck. Now obviously in best of one, since we're not sideboarding, we're going to be using all of our sideboard slots on Khan the Great creator. Um, however, these seven cards are basically the absolute minimum you need really, so if I was going to play this deck in best of three, I would probably be looking to run more Khan wishboard targets, which means at that point that you're struggling to find room for actual sideboard cards. And the second issue is, even if you did find room for sideboard cards, it's really hard to sideboard with this deck because it's so linear and so focused on what it's doing. You know, Storm the Festival is probably the card that you can afford to trim the most, but the issue with this deck is any changes you make to the sideboard going into games 2 and 3 will just make the combo less consistent overall. So that's why I prefer playing it in best of one, just because, you know, you're going to end up spending a lot of your sideboard slots on Khan anyway, and the sideboard cards you do bring in make your combo less consistent anyway. So that's why I prefer playing the deck in best of one, but you absolutely could port it to best of three if you wanted to as well. So anyway, um... For those of you who don't know, Paradox Engine is the central card of this deck, and every single combo that we're going to try and achieve requires Paradox Engine. So it's the most important card in the deck, and it's the card the deck is built around as well. So it's a 5 mana legendary artifact, and it says whenever you cast a spell, untap all non land permanents you control. So the way that we're trying to use this is, first of all, we have a bunch of non land permanents that produce mana. So we've got 4 Mox Amber, 4 Moon Snare Prototype, 4 Land War Elves, and 4 Tangled Florahedron. Uh, we also have four Courier's Briefcase as well, which can ramp into the Paradox Engine, but we can't use it to combo off with Paradox Engine because it's only one use. But anyway, these uh, non-land mana producers are great, first of all, at being able to ramp into Paradox Engine and our other expensive cards as well. But once we have Paradox Engine in play, we can use it to repeatedly produce mana. So before we play any spells, we can just tap down all of our non-land mana sources. Then when we cast the spell, Paradox Engine will untap all of our non-land mana sources, which allows us to either just make extra use of our mana, which is kind of the, the flaw with this card. But what we're trying to do is either set up loops that are mana neutral, so that we can start performing infinite loops, or in a lot of situations you can also produce infinite mana off Paradox Engine with these. So these non land mana producers are really essential at providing explosive starts to help ramp into cards like Paradox Engine, Storm the Festival and Khan. And then are also really crucial to enable us to combo off with the Paradox Engine. So like, what I'm going to do first is just have a quick look at Kinnan, which is one of the most important cards in the deck to do while we're talking about mana. And then I'm going to go over the main three loops that this deck does so that you can learn how to combo off with the Paradox Engine. So, like I said, Kinnan is a really important card in this deck. So it's a two mana legendary creature, which first of all is really important for Mox Amber. Mox Amber is one of the most important cards in the deck. And Kinnan, Emery, and Reality Chip all enable it. Kinnan itself, though, two mana two two, and whenever we tap an online permanent for mana, we add an extra mana of the type that it produced. So what that essentially means is that we basically get to double up the mana that we get off all of these uh, mana producers. It also doubles up the mana off Courier's Briefcase as well. So Kinnan enables some insanely fast starts you know it can it can enable a turn two where you play Kinnan and Khan in the same turn because if you go turn one land or elves on turn two you can play your land for turn you can play a mox amber and then play Kinnan and then once Kinnan is in play both your land or elves and your mox amber both tap for two mana which then enables you to play Khan on turn two as well so as you can see Kinnan first of all just enables some insanely explosive starts but it's also great with Paradox Engine because all of the mana sources that we tap doubles up, which means that it's way easier for us to either go mana neutral if we need for an infinite loop, or more often than not to go 
producing infinite mana when we loop off as well. Then it also has an activated ability. We can put, pump seven mana into it to look at the top five cards of our library and put a non-human creature onto the battlefield. So this is great because even if we don't have much else going on, you know, say we get thought seized or we just keep a very fast start with Kinnan and not much else, it provides its own mana sink that we can use to dig for our other important cards like Emery and Reality Chip as well. So Kinnan is great at just providing insanely fast starts, enabling us to get to a point with the mana off Paradox Engine that we can go infinite, and also providing its own mana sink if we don't have much else going on. So Kinnan, really important part of the deck. Uh, then next up I'm going to start looking at some of the loops that we're hoping to do. So first of all, we're going to have a look at the Emery loops. So Emery is a 3 mana creature, but it costs 1 less to cast for each artifact we control. So ideally we want to be casting this for 1 mana, which we will most of the time. Casting it for 2 mana on turn 2 is also completely reasonable. You know, you can just play something like a Mox Amber or a Prototype on turn 1, which will then allow you to play Emery on turn 2, which is great. When it enters the battlefield, we mill 4 cards, and then we can tap it, choose an artifact in our graveyard and we can cast it this turn. So the milling of the four cards, hopefully you'll hit an artifact in that that you can cast off it. Uh, the one big downside of Emery is it does have to survive a turn cycle in order to use its activated ability, but once its ability is online, it's such a powerful card. First of all because it allows us to cast Paradox Engine from the graveyard, say we mill it over in the four cards, it enables us to get Paradox Engine onto the battlefield, um, but once we have Paradox Engine into play, it works really well with Emery because Whenever we cast the spell that we've chosen from our graveyard off the Emery, Paradox Engine then untaps the Emery. So if we have an artifact that we can sacrifice, we can just repeatedly pick that artifact from the graveyard, play it, which will then untap the Emery, sacrifice the artifact, and then we can just loop it with Emery over and over again. So the card that we're trying to loop with Emery is Courier's Briefcase. So Courier's Briefcase two mana artifact which is a treasure itself so we can sacrifice tap and sacrifice it to add a mana of any color and when it enters the battlefield we get a 1-1 green and white citizen creature token so the idea with emery is say we have emery and paradox engine and just one non-land mana source so say we have you know just a land of our elves for example we can go infinite with courier's briefcase because we can select it from the graveyard play it with, uh, tap all of our mana sources, play the Courier's Briefcase which will untap the Emery and our mana sources, then we can sacrifice the Courier's Briefcase to produce a green mana, tap Emery to pick it from the graveyard again, and then even if we have only one mana available, because the Courier's Briefcase is also producing a mana, that provides us the two mana to cast Briefcase over and over and over again. So just with one mana source, Emery and Paradox Engine, we can produce infinite one ones off the Briefcase, which is sick. You know, oftentimes that's going to be enough to win the game on its own. Downside of that is obviously the tokens don't have haste, so you can't win that turn, but even that combo on its own, you know, you're just creating infinite creatures which can win a lot of games. If you have an additional mana source available, so say you had like a Lanawar Elves and a Mox Amber, at that point you're also producing infinite mana because you're netting a mana every time. And if one of those mana sources is green, you know, in that example I gave, we have a Lanor Elves, we can also draw infinite cards, because since Lanor Elves produces green every time we loop with Paradox Engine, that is providing us with the green mana to play the briefcase, so we can then start sacrificing the briefcase to produce manas of other uh, of other colours. So, you know, we can go Lan tap Lanor Elves, tap Mox Amber, which is providing the two mana to cast the briefcase every time we sacrifice it, and then we can start making other mana colours, so sacrifice it to make white, loop it, bring it back, sacrifice it to make black, loop it, bring it back, sacrifice it to make red, loop it, bring it back, and then once we have one mana of every colour, we can then sacrifice it to draw three cards, and then we can just do that loop over and over and over again, and then we'll draw through our whole deck, and basically we'll be able to win the game off uh, Khan, which I'll get to in a little bit later, or actually... We might as well talk about it now. Um, so yeah, if you're looping Emery and Briefcase and you're drawing through your whole deck, you basically just draw, uh, you'll draw more uh, non-land mana producers like Mox Amber and Internet Prototype. So you'll eventually be able to cast Khan. You can then get Khan, minus to it, grab Aetherflux Reservoir. So this is a full mana artifact. And whenever we cast a spell, we gain one life for each spell we've cast this turn. And then we can pay 50 life to deal 50 damage to any target. So since we're essentially just doing an infinite loop here, if we can get Aetherflux Reservoir in play, we'll repeatedly gain life over and over again with the Reservoir. And then once we're above 50 life, we can just dome the opponent for 50 and just win on the spot. So Emery Plus Briefcase is a really, really sick way to win the game. And there's multiple loops you can do. And the, the great thing about this loop is you don't really need to have that much 
non-dime minus sources in order to pull it off. Uh, even outside of briefcase, we do have a few ways of producing infinite mana with Emery. If we have Emery alongside a couple of copies of Moxamber and Paradox Engine, uh, say we have one Moxamber on the battlefield and one in the graveyard, we can tap the Ember for mana, target the second Amber in the graveyard with Emery, uh, and then with full control mode on, we can then cast the Moxamber from the graveyard, which will then untap the uh, Mox Amber in play with Paradox Engine, and if we have full control mode enabled, we can then tap that Mox Amber before the second one enters the battlefield, and then we can just loop that over and over and over again to produce infinite mana. Uh, we can also go infinite with multiple, multiple copies of the Reality Chip if we have a bunch of other mana in play, because that will keep dying to the Legend Roll as well. So there are a couple ways to produce infinite mana. Obviously, we do need to have another card alongside Emery to utilize that mana. You know, if we have Khan and infinite mana, we can win the game. I'm going to talk about the Khan loops a little bit later. And if we have uh, Kinnon and infinite mana, we also win the game because we can just keep putting the mana into Kinnon until we hit the reality chip. Then once we have reality, reality chip in play, we can reconfigure it, and then we can just keep playing off the top of our deck. And if we ever hit a land that we can't play, we can just keep pumping the mana into Kinnon to clear the top of our library again. So Emery, even without briefcase, can also produce infinite mana, which then allows us to win alongside Khan or Kinnon. So those are the Emery loops. Next up we're going to have a look at the Reality Chip. So this is a 2 mana legendary artifact. Uh, we can look at the top card of our library at any time and as long as it's reconfigured we can play lands and cast spells from the top of our library. So even without Paradox Engine this is a really efficient way of just producing a ton of card advantage. Uh, as you can see we've only got I think it's uh, 18 lands in the deck and the curve is very low as well so even without Paradox Engine we can just use this to dig through our deck and just produce a ton of card advantage. But when we do have Paradox Engine in play, Reality Chip is insane because as long as we don't brick on lands and we have some mana sources in play, we'll just be able to keep casting stuff off the top of our library because while we have access to cards off the top of our library, before we cast any of them, we can just tap all of our mana sources. Paradox Engine will untap them, so we'll just have an insane amount of mana available. And the only way that's going to stop us comboing off with Reality Chip is if we hit a land that we can't play. So the ideal situation with Reality Chip is to have it alongside a Kinnon, because you'll be producing a ton of mana off the Paradox Engine, casting a ton of spells off the top of your library, and then if you hit a land that you can't cast, you can just pump mana into Kinnon to either put a creature into play or just get that land off the top to keep comboing off. So Reality Chip is a great way to just produce card advantage and help dig for Paradox Engine and other cards when we don't have much else going on. And then once we have it alongside Kin, and we can often just win the game on its own if we have Paradox Engine as well. And then finally we've got Khan. Uh, now Khan, uh, I'm going to talk about the Wishboard in a minute, but the Khan loop is probably the most important to learn in this deck because it's probably the one that comes up the most often, and it's also a loop that you often use from other loops. So the Reality Chip that I was just talking about then, if you do have it alongside Kinnon, the way you will win is by getting to Khan and then performing this Khan loop that I'm going to talk about now. So the way the Khan loop works is you need to have Paradox Engine, Khan, and four mana's worth of non-land mana permanent. So what I mean by that is just have a way to produce four mana off your repeatable non-land uh, mana producers. So, for example, you could have like, I don't know, two Lanamar Elves, a Moon Snare Prototype, and a Mox Amber. That adds up to four. Or, you know, Kinnon really helps to achieve this as well. So, you could have, for example, Lanamar Elves, Mox Amber, and Kinnon. That also adds up to four non land permanents. You basically need four mana that you can just repeatedly get back with the Paradox Engine. So, for this, for simplicity's sake, let's say we have Paradox Engine, Kinnon, Mox Amber and Lanawar Elves, and we have a Khan in hand. So the way it works is, we tap our permanents for mana, play the Khan, get the 4 mana back, then we minus Khan to get Ancestral Statue. So this is a 4 mana artifact creature, so 3-4, and when it enters the battlefield, <coughs> we return a non-land permanent we control to our hand. So we cast the Ancestral Statue, get the 4 mana back, and we use its ability to bounce Khan back to our hand. Then we play the Khan, get the mana back off engine, we minus the Khan to grab Portal of Sanctuary. So this is a 3 mana artifact, and it has an ability. We pay 1 and tap it to return a creature to our hand. And we can activate this during our turn only. So we play the Portal of Sanctuary, get 4 mana back, and we'll also have 1 mana floating here as well, because Portal of Sanctuary only costs 3 mana. 
So we use that floating mana to bounce the ancestral statue back to our hand. Then we cast the statue again, bouncing Khan again. Then we play the Khan again, get the four mana back. And at this point, if you have one mana spare, and what I mean by that is if you have, for example, more than four mana repeatedly you're getting off the engine, you'll be producing extra mana. Or if you just have like a land untapped that you haven't used yet, then you can simply use the con to grab the Aether Flux Reservoir. Uh, you can use the excess mana off the Portal of Sanctuary to bounce the statue back to your hand. And then you can just repeatedly cast statue, bouncing itself to its own ability over and over again. And with Aether Flux Reservoir in play, every time we cast the statue and bounce it back, we'll be triggering the reservoir and then we can just win with the reservoir. So that's how the, the loot works. If at that point you don't have any excess mana, so say for example you have Kinnan, Llanowar Elves and Mox Amber, but your lands are completely tapped out and you, you have exactly four mana, then instead of getting Aether Flux Reservoir, what you do at this point is get the cheapest artifact you have available to you. So most of the time that'll be Tormod's Crypt. So you get the Tormod's Crypt, you play the Tormod's Crypt, which will give you four mana back. So at this point you have four mana as usual, plus you have four extra mana because you haven't spent any mana to cast the Tormod's Crypt. Then you use one of that mana to bounce the Ancestral Statue back to your hand with Portal of Sanctuary. Play the Ancestral Statue again, bouncing Khan back to your hand. Play the Khan, which uh, will then untap all your permanents again off the Paradox Engine. And now we can use Khan to grab the Aether Flux Reservoir. Then we can bounce the Ancestral Statue again with uh, Portal of Sanctuary. And then we can just cast Ancestral Statue again. So the only difference between the loops there is that Instead of just going for Aether Flux Reservoir, we basically just get a cheap artifact in order to give us that excess mana that we need to bounce Ancestral Statue with Portal of Sanctuary. So that might sound like quite a lot, but once you perform this loop a few times, it's pretty easy to remember. And it's really important to learn this particular loop because it's probably the one that comes up the most often. And like I said, it's also the one that you need to do to win off the reality ship as well. So. So that's how you win off Khan. You just need Khan, uh, four mana, and then you can just win with Ancestral Statue and Aether Flux Reservoir. Um, then Paradox Engine itself, uh, obviously the central card in the deck. Uh, the reason that I'm only running three copies in the main is because we have the fourth copy in the side here. So that means that between Khan and Paradox Engine, we essentially have seven copies of it in the deck, which is really important. And then the last card in the deck is Storm the Festival. So this is a six mana sorcery. We look at the five top five cards of our library and we can put two permanents with mana value five or less from among them on the battlefield and then it has flashback for 10 mana. So this is great at just digging for whatever we need and also providing us with another mana sink as well because a lot of the times, especially if you have Kinnan and a bunch of mana enablers, you're not always going to have something to do with that mana and Storm the Festival is a great card to ramp into because it can hit every important card in our deck. It can hit Paradox Engine, it can hit Khan, as well as all the other smaller bits, you know, being able to hit Kinnan to double up all your mana is insane, hitting Reality Chip to just cast cards off the top is insane, hitting Emery to enable those loops are insane. So Storm the Festival is just great as giving us another top end card to ramp into because one of the problems with this deck, if you're not running a card like Storm the Festival, is that you can end up with starts where you just have a bunch of ramp and then nothing to play with that, with all the mana that you have available. So Storm the Festival is great at digging for cards. Uh, the flashback also means that, you know, if we keep ramping, we we can do it again. And Storm the Festival is also just really nice. First of all, alongside Emery, because it's a card that we don't mind milling over because we can cast it with a flashback later. But it's also really nice when we're going off with, re with Reality Chip, because if we don't have Kinnan, if we hit a land on top and we have a Storm the Festival in hand or graveyard, we can often just cast it, dig for stuff, and then clear the land off the top of the library. And then, since we gen g generally tend to make an insane amount of mana when we're going off with Reality Chip, we can then also cast it for the flashback if we hit another land. So Storm the Festival is just great at giving us more top ends to ramp into, that can dig for everything that we want to be able to dig for um, and is also just great at comboing off with other cards as well. Uh, and then Khan, I've also talked about this kind of briefly, um, it's really important part of the deck at both digging for Paradox Engine um, and as I've said from the Khan loops, it's a really integral part of being able to win as well. But uh, even outside of the minus two, 
The fact that it shuts down activated abilities of artifacts the opponent's control is very relevant. Uh, first of all, against cards like Witch's Oven, you know, against the Sacrifice decks, it shuts off their Witch's Oven and only Cult Anvil. And very importantly as well, it also shuts off the crew abilities on their vehicles. So while Khan is in play, the opponent can't crew up Parhelion or Sky Sovereign, which is really strong against the Greasefang decks. And then the plus one, we can turn an artifact... Uh, a non-creature artifact into a creature for the turn. Generally, we don't really want to be doing that because it then enables the opponent to potentially kill important artifacts that we have with creature removal, but that can be useful at defending Khan and also getting in for extra damage if we need. Um, so, while we're talking about Khan, I might as well talk about the other wishboard targets that we've got. So, first of all, Tormod's Crypt is... Well, I, I feel like you have to be running Graveyard Hate in your Khan wishboard, and I really like Tormod's Crypt First of all, because it allows you to grab uh, Graveyard Hate the turn you play it. So even if you only have exactly four mana available, it allows you to immediately play the Graveyard Hate, which can be very important. You know, if, if the opponent has something like a Croxa, for example, that they're ready to escape next turn, if you were running Soul Guide Lancer or, or Unlicensed Hurst, you wouldn't be able to shut that off quickly. So Tormod's Crypt as Graveyard Hate that you can play the turn you play Khan, even if you have no other mana, mana available, is really nice. The other really nice thing about Tormod's Crypt though is that it's simply zero mana, which is really important because with Paradox Engine it's very easy to get to a position where you have your engine, you have all the cards that you need to combo off, but you're tapped out. You know, you had to tap out in order to set up everything that you had. And if you have a car on the battlefield, uh, you can just simply minus two, grab a Tormod's Crypt, and since it costs zero mana, it will then, you know, you don't need mana to play it and it will still trigger the Paradox Engine to untap all your stuff and then enable, to com enable you to combo off that turn. So having a zero mana artifact that you can grab off Khan in order to untap all your stuff off Paradox Engine often can win you games just because it will allow you to, t to combo off a turn sooner which is huge. Uh, then we've got the fourth copy of Reality Chip, so similar to Paradox Engine, the reason that I'm only running three chip in the main deck is because we have the fourth one in the sideboard to grab off Khan. So this is really important, first of all for scenarios where we have Paradox Engine but not much else going on, you know, say we don't have an Emery or we don't have a Kinnon or we just don't have enough mana in order to do the Ancestral Statue Loop yet. We can just grab Reality Chip in order to start comboing off with Engine and try and get to a point where we have four mana available that we can do the Ancestral Statue Loop off Khan. Um, even if we don't have Engine, grabbing Reality Chip uh, on a board where we can just reconfigure it is also really nice if we just need card advantage, so being able to grab Chip off Khan is really important. Then Portal of Sanctuary, Aetherflux Reservoir and Ancestral Statue are mandatory here because they're part of the Khan loops, how we win with Khan and off the Reality Chip combo. Uh, Paradox Engine, obviously, you know, we want to have the fourth in the sideboard so that we essentially have seven copies. And then Meteor Golem, this is kind of a flex slot, uh, I guess, but I really like Meteor Golem here as just a way to deal with any problematic permanence because there are certain ways the opponent can stop you from comboing off and winning. You know, if the opponent has like a ley line of sanctity, that stops you from being able to hit them with the Aetherflux Reservoir. If the opponent has something like an Archon of Amiria, that will stop you playing more than one spell in each turn. So I like having Meteor Golem here as just uh, you know an, an answer to basically any random problematic permanent the opponent has. But there are other cards that you could potentially run. Um, you know, you could potentially run Pithing Needle. You could potentially run a card called Strider Harness, which gives which is an equipment that you can use to give Emery haste. So if you have Paradox Engine and Emery. You can uh, and Corey's briefcase in the graveyard. You can just use Khan to get Strider Harness to combo off with Emery that turn. Um, so and you, you know you could also run other types of graveyard hate. So th there's a a lot of cards you could replace Meteor Golem with if you wanted to, but I've really liked Meteor Golem as just an answer to any problematic permanent, which is particularly important in best of one when you don't really know what the opponent's going to be running and you could you could run into anything. Um, so that's pretty much the whole deck. Um, going to briefly talk about the mana base. Like I said, 18 lands has been fine. We've got 4 ta Tangled Florahedron, which is really nice as it doubles up as both a mana dork to work with the Paradox Engine and also a tap land if we need to. So Flora, even though we've got 18 lands, which is very low, we have got Florahedron, which we can also play as lands. Uh, in terms of the actual lands themselves, we've got the good 12 dual lands here. Botanical Sanctum as a fast land is really nice in this deck because we're a very low to the ground deck. We want to be ramping and getting to the board as quickly as possible. So fast lands in this deck are great. Pathway and shock lands are also great as well. 
couple of each basic and then I've got two of each of the channel lands as well I really like running a couple of these you know obviously the danger of running these is if uh, if you draw two of them it's not great but this deck is very light on interaction so being able to run lands that can interact and are fairly efficient at what they do as well um, is really great you know besides you being able to kill any artifact enchantment or you know man lands the opponent might have is really great and Ottawara just giving us an answer to basically anything is really strong as well you know the one downside of relying on Meteor Golem is that it's very expensive so if the opponent does have a random permanent being able to get rid of it for the turn to enable us to combo off with Ottawara is great and the other great thing uh, about this particular build with these cards is we do have a lot of legendary creatures in the deck which will often reduce the cost of channeling these lands in as well so uh, so that's the deck, it's been so much fun to play this deck again. If you love all in combo decks, absolutely give this deck a try. Uh, now onto the gameplay, I've just got a full uh, best of one constructed events worth of gameplay so you guys can see the deck in action. So if you've got any comments at all about the deck, uh, as, or any questions at all, drop me a comment down below. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the gameplay, big up. Okay sweet, here we go. Okay, so going first to... Yeah, I think this is a reasonable keep. It's annoying with the Tangle Floor Hedron because we really do need to hit our third land. So I'm, I'm really tempted to play this tapped just because I'd really like to curve out into untapped land on turn two and three. The problem with playing Floor, floor Hedron as a land there is we now no longer... I was going to say we now no longer have a Mana Dork that we can use with Kinnon to produce extra mana. Now this is quite a tough turn to know what to play here because if we want to play Kinnon I think we're incentivized to play Llanowar Elves first here so that we can double the mana off it next turn which is obviously slightly mana efficient. If we wanted to be more efficient with the mana we could play Reality Chip but I think highest upside player here is playing Llanowar Elves and then playing Kinnon next turn. We could have shocked in the Breeding Pool but I like playing Sanctum here just in case we draw Sanctum. We really don't want to have one of them entering play taps. Okay, Paradox Engine's a great draw here. So we can play Kinnon and then Reality Chip. And then assuming none of our elves lives till next turn, we can then cast Paradox Engine. Uh, and then, you know, we're not that far away from comboing off at that point. And thankfully, Angels that we're up against is pretty slow normally to close the game out. So that's the sort of deck that we're looking to face with this sort of deck. So we're going to play Paradox Engine here. Again, we would really like to play Florahedron as a Mana Dork if possible, but I think I'm just going to play it out as a land here. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's greedy. Um, you know, if it was something like a Moonsnare prototype where we didn't have to wait a turn for it to start producing mana, then I think there's an argument to holding on to it. But since it won't start generating mana until the following turn, I don't think it's worth it. Okay, Resplendent Angel is pretty bad here because we're just dead on board, I think. Yeah, so we, we need to combo off this turn. So we need a bit of help off the top of the deck with Reality, ch reality Chip here. So we'll tap the Elves and reconfigure the Reality Chip. And just got to hope that we get a, a little bit lucky on the top of our deck here. So we play the Elves, untaps the other Lanoir Elves, and Khan. I mean, we can cast Khan and we can minus the Khan to grab two or mod script to untap the Lanoir Elves again if we do Brick. Um, so I think we'll just lead on the Khan here. And then I think we'll see what else we can hit before we activate the Khan. Because we could activate it now, but... Oh, wow. Okay, I'm very glad we didn't. Because now, with the Mox Amber, that was a sick hit. Because now we can just win. Because we have four mana available. We can just go for the Khan loop. So we'll minus the Khan to grab Ancestral Statue. Tap off four mana. Play the Ancestral Statue, which we use to bounce Khan back to our hand. Then we'll play the Khan again uh, and grab Portal of Sanctuary this time, which we can then use to bounce the Ancestral Statue. So we'll minus the Khan here, grab the Portal of Sanctuary, tap the Amber and the Lanor Elves again, play the Portal of Sanctuary, and now we can use this to bounce the Statue back to our hand. And we can play 4 mana again, play the Statue, uh, bouncing Khan back to our hand this time. Uh, now we can also, since we have spare mana, we can also bounce the Ancestral Statue back now. And then we can play Khan again. And since we did have that spare mana and we've bounced the Ancestral Statue, we can just grab Aetherflux Reservoir now. So we can play the Reservoir. And then all we do from this point is just repeatedly cast Ancestral Statue and bounce it to its own ability over and over again. And every time we cast the Statue, we'll be gaining a bunch of life off the Reservoir. And then... As soon as we're above 50 life, we can just use the Reservoir to kill the opponent, just doing 50 damage to them. And even, you know, the opponent's obviously going to be getting a lot of life. This is infinite, even if the opponent had, like, 
200 life. We could just do this until we could activate Reservoir four times. So now we're above 50. And we can just dome the opponent with the Reservoir here. Sweet, we got there. Okay, sweet. So we're going first here, and hmm. This is pretty close, but I think it's a pretty reasonable keep. We've got turn 1 Nano Rolls, we've got Florahedron as our land on turn 2. We've got Briefcase that, even though we haven't got Blue Mana, we've got Briefcase that can produce Blue Mana, so. I think this is a pretty reasonable keep. Huh, okay, so we're against Mono Blue Tempo, so we could potentially just play Briefcase out and play. I mean, we kind of want to play Florahedron as a mana source, considering we have Paradox Engine. Since we're against Mono Blue Tempo, I'm pretty inclined here just to play Reality Chip, while they don't have mana up for a counter spell, because we can reconfigure the chip next turn. I'm going to attack here, because I'm pretty certain they're not going to trade, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we can reconfigure the Reality Chip next turn, which is going to make it really difficult, unless they have a Bounce Spell in response. I think that's going to be very difficult for them to beat. They're going to struggle to beat us playing cards off the top of the deck. So... That's my game plan at the moment, basically. Just we we you know, this mono blue can be a rough matchup because if you're relying on cast like resolving your paradox engine and they just have counter spells for it, it's very difficult to beat that. But if we can get reality chip online, we're gonna be casting way more spells than they have counter spells just because we're we're just gonna be churning through our deck. So I think getting reality chip in play while they have no counter spells and getting it online, you know, they could have had Fading Hope or Brazen Borrow it in response then, which could would have kinda wasted our turn, but I think this is probably the best way to navigate this match up. Okay, so untap land on top is good. Hopefully we don't brick again. Okay, Mox Amber's nice. Oh wow, Kinnon is sick. Because if this resolves, then our oh, Lanor Elves and that Mox Amber both produce two mana each. We could potentially even try resolving Paradox Engine this turn if, if Kinnon resolves her. So that was a sick hit. Okay, they've got Geist Light like Snare. We can pay for that, so we definitely will. That probably means they've got a second one, though, I imagine. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's fine. We've used up two of their best counter spells, and we're still playing off the top of our deck, so... It is a bit... Okay, especially now with the second Curious Obsession. This Ascendant Spirit is a bit of an issue, but... We're going to be playing off the top of our deck again <coughs> if they don't have a bounce spell here, so... So I still feel like we've got a decent game plan here. Okay, they say play a second Ascendant Spirit, so we'll just see what we hit off the top first. Now again, we could just play Paradox Engine here, but I think that's a waste of a turn. We want to try and maximise our mana uh, and play as much off the top as we can here. So Emery's great here. That will turn on the Mox Amber, hopefully. Okay, that's that resolving is huge because now Ottawara is online. We can still play the Moonsnare prototype and afford to pay for Ottawara here by sacking the briefcase, so... So yeah, I feel pretty good about this spot now because... Next turn we can just use Ottawara to bounce that 4-5 to stop them gaining card advantage. And we have a pretty well set up board. Okay, they, they flash and rattle chains, presumably again, they're going to give the 4-5 hexproof, so we'll just use Ottawara in response here. Select the briefcase, and obviously the Ottawa is reduced because Emery is legendary. So now I feel pretty good about this spot. Okay, Icon of Ancestry. So they're trying to race here, I guess, but if they tap out, uh, we should just be able to win here because we have briefcase and paradox engine with Emery. So we have basically infinite 1-1s, one -one's, infinite card draw, and infinite mana as well. So I'm gonna, I block there just because we don't really need the 1-1. One, one. It doesn't really make a difference. Oh wait, I should have tapped the Moon Snare prototype first there. Oh well, it shouldn't really end up mattering. Hopefully. Yeah, we should have, we should have uh, tapped the reality chip to the prototype, but we have more than enough mana here anyway, so it shouldn't matter, hopefully. So we'll play the briefcase here, which will untap all of our lands. We can just repeatedly cast the briefcase from the graveyard with Emery. Okay, sweet. And then, yeah, we can just cr make mana of each colour and then keep drawing cards. Okay, sweet, we're going first here. And yeah, this hand looks sick. 
you know, potentially turn one Nine Warriors into turn two Emery, and then, you know, assuming the Nine Warriors lives, we can then go turn three Khan, turn four Paradox Engine, which is sick. So, getting the Nine Warriors killed here would be pretty brutal, though, so hopefully we avoid that. Okay, nice. So, God is trying to tap, so we can just go Amber here to reduce Emery's cost by one, which then enables us to just get a free attack in with the Nine Warriors here. Let's see what we mill. Okay, unfortunately no artifacts off the mill, which is a little bit rough, but we have Khan and Engine in hand, so we can't really complain too much. So next turn, I think we might be interested in getting Engine into play, and then try and go for Khan the following play. Gen uh, generally, if the opponent's not playing counter spells, it's a good idea to get Paradox Engine into play as soon as possible. Wow, the opponent's just going to hand size. Oh, okay, I imagine they did that intentionally then, so they must have Grease Fang but no discard outlet. So we'll play the engine here, and actually wait, we can just win this turn, right? We have two Mox Ambers, which produces infinite mana. So we can go into full control mode, play the Amber here, and then if you don't go into full control, it will just automatically put the Amber into play before you get to tap the first one. But since we went into full control mode there, we get to tap that first Mox Amber before the second one comes back. So then we can just keep looping Mox Ambers here, just go into full control before you cast the second one. And then with the Mox Amber on the stack, you can tap the first one. And now we can just play Khan. Well, we'll tap these for, for mana first. Well, we can just play Khan and grab Aetherflux Reservoir. And then just keep looping these Mox Ambers. Gain a bunch of life and then just dome the opponent for 50. So wow, we got a turn 3 win here. That's pretty sick. Okay, nice. Okay, sweet, so we're going first here, and yeah, this seems a pretty reasonable keep. Our game plan here is basically just ramp into Storm the Festival. So we've got Lionel Royals on one, Corey's Briefcase on two. If we can find a legendary creature, we've also got Amber that can help ramp us there, so... So we'll run out of Sanctum here into Lionel Royals and see what the opponent's on. Definitely want to hold on to Mox Amber, you know, zero mana or cheap artifacts in general is better to hold on to unless you need to cast them because you often want to use them to untap all your stuff with Paradox Engine, particularly Mox Amber is useful at doing that. Okay, so opponent leaves on Thoughtseize here, so... I mean, obviously the card that we're worried the most about losing here is Courier's Briefcase. We don't really care that much about losing one of the Storm Festivals or Amber. Taking Briefcase does take us further away from Storm, so I imagine that's what they'll go for here. But yeah, like I was saying, Mox Amber, holding onto it when you don't need to play it is really important because there are often turns where you tap out to get everything in play that you need to combo off. And then um, you can use zero mana artifacts like Mox Amber to trigger the engine to untap everything, which will then allow you to combo off a turn sooner. Oh wow, perfect. Okay, so fourth land is great here. We can just slam Khan. I mean, hopefully they could have Jory, Distri uh, Jory Disruption or Sensor, but... I think we just have to slam the Khan there. So here, I mean, normally you'd want to get Paradox Engine when you don't have it, but since we don't have much else going on, I'm pretty tempted to get Reality Chip here. Because next turn, even if we don't draw a land, we can play Amber, play the Reality Chip, and then we can also reconfigure it all in the same turn. Oh wow. Okay, Kinnon's a sick draw, because now we can, we can grab Paradox Engine, we can play the Amber, you always want to play Amber before Kinnon, by the way. Because uh, they can kill it in response if you play the Amber afterwards, which will mean you get less mana. And now we can just slam Paradox Engine this turn, which is huge. And then next turn we have Reality Chip, we have Storm the Festival. So unless the opponent has a way to kill Engine here, I feel pretty... Or I guess killing Kinnon also slows us down quite a bit. But yeah, I feel pretty confident. So Otherworldly Gaze... So it looks like they're on Grease Fang, I'd imagine. Esper Grease Fang. So it's, it's hard to know because these builds are all, uh, they're all built pretty differently. Some are more controlling, some are more just focused on the combo. Okay, so they supply it <coughs> and just pass the turn back. Okay, so I think... Oh wait, I shouldn't have played that land out actually. I should have held that land in hand because we're going to reconfigure Reality Chip here. That was, really, that was a really stupid mistake. Because now the next land that we hit off the off the top of our deck, we're not going to be able to play because we already played our island out. So that was definitely a big mistake by my... Uh, Lanawar Elves will untap our stuff here. 
And we can keep going off. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so we can play the Florahedron, which will one-tap everything. We can play the Prototype. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that we're going to be able to win here. We're basically just digging through our deck to try and hit another Khan so that we can go for the Ancestral Statue Loop. Uh, but since we've got Kinnan alongside Reality Chip and two Storm the Festivals, the chances of us breaking here are so low. Oh wait, we should have definitely tapped that Moon Snare prototype as well. I'm playing a little bit too fast and a bit sloppy here, but... I mean, it's, again, since we we have so much mana off Kinnan, I'm pretty certain, even if we do play a bit suboptimally, we should be good to win here, I think. So we'll play Lanor Elves off the top, hit another land, unfortunately, but we still have... You know, we have Storm the Festival... So three different Storm the Festivals that we can play because of the flashback. And we can also pump mana into Kinnan even if we didn't have Storm the Festivals in order to get lands off the top. So we'll activate the Prototype, activate the Amber, activate the Lanor Elves, and then we'll play another Storm the Festival. So yeah, we're just looking for Khan here basically. As soon as we hit Khan, we just we can just win immediately. Ha, huh, okay, that's pretty rough. I mean it's good that we got all these lands out of the way now though. We'll put two lands into play here. Okay, another Kinnon on top, so we'll definitely just play that to generate some more mana. Okay, that untaps everything again. So we'll activate Prototype, activate Amber, and then I think we'll just flash back one of these Storm the Festivals here, instead of pumping mana into Kinnon, because it will help us get close to Khan, hopefully. Ha, uh, another miss on Khan, but we should be getting closer to it now, I imagine. Okay, another whiff on top, but that's fine, because we have... Like I said, we've got Storm the Festival we can play, and we can activate Kinnon as well to get this land off the top. Ha, huh, another brick. That's kind of annoying. Ha, huh, Emery, I mean, my only concern here is we're so far ahead, and the way we can lose here is if we mill all the Khans off Emery, so I'm going to activate Kinnon to try and get Emery off the top. Oh, wait, <clears throat> I didn't mean to do that. I meant to click on the Florahedron. I mean, thankfully we didn't mill the Khans, but I think it probably would have been the correct play to just put Florahedron into play there, because even though we'd get incredibly unlucky to mill all of our Khans with Emery, it is a possibility. Now we finally hit the Khan, we can just do the statue loop, so... Tap all our stuff here, play the statue, which we can use to bounce the Khan. Tap all of our stuff again. And then we can play the Khan again, which we can use to get the Portal of Sanctuary. Then we tap our stuff again, play the Portal of Sanctuary, which we then use to bounce the Ancestral Statue. Tap all of our stuff again here. And then we can play the Statue to bounce Khan back to our hand again. Tap all of our stuff again here, and then we can use Khan to just grab the Aether Flux Reservoir here. And then we can just bounce the statue back to hand with the Portal of Sanctuary, and then we can just repeatedly cast statue to win the game here. So we bounce the statue again. Tap all of our stuff down. Then we play the Aether Flux Reservoir. And now we can just repeatedly cast Statue. And it shouldn't take too many goes because we've cast a lot of spells this turn already. So we'll play the Statue again. And now, yeah, now we're above 50, so we can just dome the opponent with the Reservoir here. Sweet. Oh, sweet, we're against Fire Shoes. Uh, if you're on Twitter and you don't follow Fire Shoes, get on it. He's the best source for, for deck list by far. Big up Fire Shoes. Okay, yeah, this hand is very explosive potentially. You know, we are missing a way to abuse the Paradox Engine, but we have a lot of upside. Okay, Lanar Elves is sick, because now we can go Kinnon and play two Lanar Elves here. And then we can play Engine next turn, and we can also pump loads of mana into Kinnon to try and find Reality Chip. Once we have a chip in play, I think we should just be good to win. 
Ha, okay. That's that's pretty annoying. So I think I think I want to play this pathway on blue because we have so much green mana off the land of our elves, and we'll just slam Paradox Engine here. And now we've just got to hope to top deck something that we can abuse the Paradox Engine with. So Reality Chip would be great, Khan would be great, um, what else? Emery potentially could be really good as well. And to be fair, even another Kinnon would be great here because then we can just start pumping our mana into Kinnon's ability. Ha, another engine isn't what we want to see. So, <clears throat> I mean, thankfully Mono Black isn't as fast as the red decks, but especially with Knight of the Evan Legion, their clock can increase pretty significantly. So I'm not going to block with any of the Lanoir Elves here because there are certain cards we can draw where we just want as many mana dorks as possible. You know, Reality Chip, for example, is a card where we would want as many ways to reuse the mana off Paradox Engine as possible. So I think I'm going to try and just not block with these Lanoir Elves as often as possible because the worst thing we could do here is chump block with the Lanoir Elves, then draw a card that could have won us the game had we had more mana dorks off Paradox Engine. Okay, so they don't fire up the Haven, which is interesting. Makes me think they're probably going to activate a Knight of the Ebon Legion, maybe? Unless they have, like, a big play to follow up with, or they want to use the Castle. Okay, so they do fire up the Knight. Puts us down to four, so we really need to draw something this turn. Ha, okay. I mean, we're almost certainly dead here, then. I'm not going to just concede immediately, because there's a chance... You know, they might think we have something in hand, maybe. But yeah, that was the turn. We really needed to draw, like, Khan or Reality Chip or even Kin and then to, to hang on there. Reality Chip would have definitely been the best card. Okay, Runkle, yeah, yeah, we're just dead here. Okay, sweet, so we're going first here, and hmm, this is an interesting hand. I feel like probably can't keep it though, because there was just too much of a mishmash going on there. If we miss lands, we're so far behind. This hand, on the other hand, is sick though. Definitely put back the beside you, and now we potentially have turn two Kinnon and Khan, because next time we can go land, mock Samba, play the Kinnon, and then play the Khan off the land of our elves and mock Samba, so... Oh no, damn it. Okay, they have a way to kill the our Elves. That's annoying. Because we could have had a crazy turn 2 there. I mean, still, we're getting a pretty decent turn 2. We can play the Amber and play the Kinnon out here. M maybe there's something to be said for holding on to Amber, but that just opens up the chance the opponent could kill the Kinnon in response to Amber if we waited until next turn to play it. So, hmm. I imagine the opponent's on either burn or mono red aggro here. Just trying to think what we want to be gra grabbing off Khan next turn. I mean, hopefully we get to cast Khan. If the opponent has a removal spell for Kin, and then we are, you know, we, we just need to top deck lands at that point. But okay, sweet. Looks like Kin survives here, which is great because we get to resolve the Khan here. Florahedron's interesting. We could play it as a tap land, but I think we're more interested in holding onto it as a mana source that we can reuse with the engine. Now typically this is the sort of spot I might look it, uh, to get a reality chip with, but I can't imagine Khan's going to be living past this turn. Whatever creature they play is going to get plus two, plus two off these Kumanos. So if it's a haste creature, I don't think we're going to want to block. So I think it's important to just get Paradox Engine now before Khan dies, if they do have a haste creature. If they don't and we get a second Khan activation, we'll definitely be looking to get reality chip here. Um... And if they do have a haste creature, like I said, I think having Kinnon in play is super important. Okay, so they do have Robber of the Rich, which is one of the creatures that I was thinking about. So, I assume they attack the Khan here, yeah. And I don't think we want to block. If we lose the Kinnon here, then Mox Samba goes offline. We can't play Engine next turn. Okay, second Engine. I mean, obviously now that we drew that, I wish I'd got the Reality Chip off Khan last turn, but it should be fine. Um, I'm, we could play Florahedron as a land here, but I, again, I think, especially now we have Engine Online, 
I would much rather get Florahedron in play as a mana dork, and then if we draw another Khan, we can just win the game immediately, because we'll have four mana available. Not going to attack with the Kinnon here, because we're never going to win through chip damage. This is a very all-in combo deck, so there's no real point in attacking and risking not having a chump blocker back if we need it. So what are we taking this turn? We're definitely not going to block with the Kinnon if they attack with all of these, so that means we go down to 10. Which isn't great, we do need to draw something good next turn, I think. Okay, double burning tree, so... We definitely need something good off the top this turn. We might not be completely dead next turn, but... Ha, okay, Emery, that could be good. So... If Emery survives here, there are a lot of ways that we could win the following turn. We just need to make sure that we survive this turn. Okay, Storm of the Festival is a nice hit. And then we can play the Florahedron. Fortunately, even with Kinnon, we don't have enough mana to flash back the Storm of the Festival, so we just have to pass here. And my real hope is that we can survive this turn with both Kinnon and Emery. If we survive with both Kinnon and Emery, I think we can win next turn. It's possible we could win with just Emery, but we'd need to get a bit lucky, I think. So I, I'm really hoping... I mean, if they animate the Den, how much damage is that here? So we have to block the 4-4. Four, four. So we'll assume we're blocking the 4-4 four, four with the Florahedron. That'll be 3-4. Hmm. Yeah, we have to block with Kinnon here as well, unfortunately. Uh, our only real chance of winning this is if we keep Emery alive. So I think we have to chump block with the Florahedron in the Kinnon and just hope that Emery can get there. Assuming they fire up the Den, that is. Okay, they played Chain Wireless. That kills the Florahedron. Does that mean... Oh, I really hope that doesn't mean we have to uh, block with both creatures here. So hold on. So if we just block the 4-4 with Kinnon, we take exactly 8 down to 1. I think that's our only way of winning the game, really. Because with Emery, we can bring back those prototypes and we can make infinite blue mana um, by looping the Opals. Oh, wow. Okay. That pathway was huge because now we can cast Storm the Festival off the infinite mana that we make. So we'll first of all we'll lead by getting back the Moon Snare prototypes here. Then we can use the prototype to tap the Paradox Engine for, to produce an extra mana. Then we can get the other prototype here. We'll play that one. And now with the Mox Ambers we can just go into full control mode after we've selected the Mox Amber, play the one from the graveyard, and then before the second one enters play we can tap the first one for mana just to get a bit more value to make sure that we are going... well if, if you don't do that it will just skip straight through to the second Amber entering play. Okay, so now we can play Storm the Festival and we just gotta hope to hit a green legendary creature like Kinnon or a Khan Oh wow, we hit a Khan, okay, sick. So now we can just go infinite. And we hit a briefcase as well. So we could have just gone infinite with the Khan loop anyway, but now we've hit a briefcase, we can just do the Emery loop, which is slightly easier to execute, I think. So we will... Hmm, I think we'll probably just loop the briefcase a few times first, just to make sure that we have enough mana. So, um, what we're doing here is we're just repeatedly cracking the briefcase to its own ability to produce a green mana, repeatedly getting it back with Emery, and since we have uh, both Moon Snow prototypes and Amber on the battlefield, we are essentially creating infinite 1-1s and infinite mana here, and then we can just use the Khan ability to get Aetherflux Reservoir and just dome the opponent with the Reservoir ability once we've gained a bunch of life. If we'd hit Kinnon instead of Khan there, we could have just made infinite mana and we can alternate between green and blue because of the Mox Amber if we had a Kinnon in play. And then we could have just pumped all that mana into Kinnon until we hit a reality chip. And then we could have just used the reality chip until we hit Khan. So Khan wasn't our only out there. We could have also hit Kinnon and, and still won the game. But yeah, this is definitely the, the slightly easier way. It takes quite a long time. And the other thing is you do have to play quite quickly because there is, in Arena, there is a limit, a time limit on your turn. So if you do take too long, especially when you're going off with Reality Chip, like if I'd had Emery plus Kinnon, that would take a long time to close the game out. So you need to make sure that you're playing relatively quickly 
especially if you don't have a deterministic loop like reality chip going but now anyway since we have Aetherflux Reservoir in play we can just keep looping the briefcase here keep gaining life off the reservoir and then once we're above 50 life we can just dome the opponent yeah sweet Okay, sweet, so we're going first here, and yeah, this hand looks pretty decent, turn one prototype into turn two Emery, then we've also got Kinnon and some Florahedrons that we can get mana off of as well, so yeah, this looks pretty decent. Okay, so my opponent mulligans, okay, sweet, so we'll lead on the prototype here, which will allow us to play Emery next turn. In general, you always want to play Emery as soon as possible, unless you know they have a, a removal s spell, but even then, you know, you want to get Emery into play as soon as possible because it, you need it to survive a turn cycle, so getting it down on turn 2 is great. So we hit a, an Amber in the graveyard, which is great with Kinnon, because next turn we can go Kinnon, get back the Amber, and then we can produce an extra... Oh, okay. <laughs> I was not expecting to see main deck Grafdigger's cage. That's pretty annoying because I'm pretty sure that stops Emery getting... Uh, getting back stuff from the graveyard, which is a little bit annoying considering we have two Emery's in hand. But at least we have Kinnon here. The other annoying thing is that I'm pretty sure... Hold on, let me read just let me just read Grafdigger's Cage. Okay, we can't cast spells from libraries, yeah, so... And Emery is a cast, yeah. Okay, so that does shut off Emery. So I, I, I did think that was the case, but I haven't played with Emery against Grafdigger's Cage in a little while. Okay, otherworldly gay, so I, I still don't really know what the opponent's on here. The other really annoying thing about Grafdigger's Cage is it also stops the flashback on Storm the Festival. Um, so I think our plan at the moment is to just try and get up to enough mana where we can uh, start activating Kinnon. But even then, I mean, Reality Chip also gets shut off by Grafdigger's Cage, so I think we're just trying to dig towards Paradox Engine. Or, ooh, okay, Storm the Festival is great because I think that works through Grafdigger's Cage. I think Cage only stops creatures entering the battlefield, so I'm going to play the, the Tangled Florahedron as a land here. First of all, because it looks like, now I've seen Search for Us Cantor, I imagine they're on some kind of Grixis control deck. Otherworldly Gaze is a bit of an odd choice, but still looks mostly like control to me, so I don't want to risk playing the, the Florahedron out as a creature in case they have a sweeper for this turn. Okay, so Sanctum... Now, unfortunately, we do have to play into Sensor and Jory Disruption, but I think we just have to slam the Storm the Festival here, because otherwise we're just attacking for 3 damage, which doesn't really do much. And we just hope to hit Engine or Khan here, I think. Wait, why did the Cage flash then? Yeah, it's only creatures, right? So we can still put Khan and either Briefcase or Prototype. I mean, we could put a land into play, but with Kinnon... I think we're probably incentivized to get Prototype into play here. Briefcase is also nice, but I think Prototype as a recurrable mana source is really important. And now we've got Calm, we can just dig for Paradox Engine. I mean, we could grab Meteor Golem. We have enough mana to cast it next turn to try and take out the Grafdigger's Cage, but I think grabbing Engine is, is more important here, especially because Black Bait, well, Grixis decks in general might have a, a, a clean way to kill Khan the Great Creator, which would mean that we then don't have access to Engine anymore. But if Khan does survive next turn, we can potentially go Engine, and then we'll have enough mana off these prototypes with Kinnon to do the Khan statue loop. Okay, so Extinction Event, and they name even. Okay, I mean, so that doesn't make a difference because we have the second Kinnon in hand, so we can lead on the Kinnon here and then we can off the Moonsner prototypes we can play the engine and still have a couple of mana left over which is great we can then play the Emery to trigger the engine to untap everything again and now we're pretty much just set to do the statue loop, we should just win this turn then so we minus Khan grab the ancestral statue Play the statue off the prototypes here. And then we bounce Khan back to our hand. And then we play the Khan again. Off the prototypes here. Grab the Portal of Sanctuary. And thankfully we have a land untapped as well. So we can do the slightly shorter version of this loop. Which is great. 
So we tap Paradox Engine. Huh, wait a second, did we mess up there? Wait, oh, whoops. We should have been able to win there. I think I'll have to go back and watch that, but I think I should have. Oh, huh, what did I do wrong there? Oh, the Moon Snow prototype didn't tap. Right, okay. So I should have manually tapped that second Moon Snow prototype. That's where the two mana missing was. Okay, thankfully we didn't get punished for it. We can just grab the reservoir now. But yeah. Okay, so make sure, don't do what I did, make sure you manually tap your Moon Snare prototype before you cast stuff. So we must have had a, a spare mana for the Portal of Sanctuary and we didn't get to untap one of the Moon Snare prototypes there. So we should have we should have won a turn earlier if I'd been more careful with my auto tap, but that didn't end up mattering thankfully, we should just still win here anyway. Just keep manually tapping the prototypes, keep playing the Ancestral Statue, balancing it to its own ability. And then as soon as we hit above 50 life, we can just dame the opponent with Aetherflux Reservoir here. Keep casting the statue here. So yeah, in general, uh, one thing that saves time comboing off with this deck in the past was pressing QQ would tap all of your sources. But unfortunately with this deck, it doesn't work with Moonsnare Prototype or your Mana Dork creatures. So it's actually not very useful. So one prob well, one annoying thing with this particular build of the deck because of prototype and because we use Florahedron and Lanawar Elves is you will have to manually tap all of your stuff a lot of the time and it's better to do it even though it's slightly slower because you don't want to make the same mistake I did there so just just try and get efficient at manually tapping your stuff if you can so we're going above 55 here and then we can just dome the opponent Sweet. Okay, sweet. So going first here, and hmm. I mean, obviously, triple Khan isn't great, but I reckon I'm going to keep it because Khan is probably the most important card in the deck. So if there was a card that I ever wanted three copies of, it was probably going to be Khan. And we have multiple ways to ramp into it, so. I mean, this is close. I could see an argument for this being a mulligan, but since Khan is a card that we always want to draw, having multiples can't be that bad. And, you know, the, one of the big weaknesses of Khan is that it typically gets attacked down pretty easily. Uh, so having backup copies could actually be good in those scenarios. This hand does kind of fall apart if they have a removal for land or else and we don't draw lands. You know, if we can't hit fourth mana for Khan, then... It's kind of brutal, but on the play with Lanar Elves and Moon Snare Prototype, I think this has high enough upside that it could work. Main Phase Spectral Sailor. Interesting. So we're obviously against some kind of tempo deck, maybe the Spirits deck. Interesting that they're not playing Snowlands, though. It means they're not playing the Ascendant Spirit. Not going to attack here because even though this is a deck where you want to race, we're racing to a combo rather than trying to race in terms of combat damage and if they do take the trade we don't have a way to cast Khan the following turn you know if we miss a land drop then we won't be able to cast it so I think not attacking with land or else is probably right there okay another land is nice that allows us to play around sensor style counter spells and to be honest you know this is the kind of hand where triple Khan could actually be pretty good if the opponent is running a lot of counter spells okay so they have the lookouts dispersal Thankfully we have another two cards in hand, so we've still got another shot at it. Okay, Storm Tamer. So it looks like they're playing more of like an old school mono blue tempo deck rather than the Spirits version. Which I'm probably happier to see because it means that their clock will likely be slower. So Emery's a nice draw here. We'll definitely need on the Emery because if Emery resolves, we can also cast Khan because we can then tap Emery using the Moon Snare prototype this turn. Okay, so Emery does resolve, which is great. Chance Khan could get countered here, but I think with a f with another one in hand, we're happy to just slam it here. Oh wow, it resolves. So they must be out of counter spells then. Surely they would counter Khan. So we'll minus here. 
And I think we'll just grab the Paradox Engine. So what we got? Double Nox Amarin Graveyard is pretty good because that means if Paradox Engine does resolve somehow, we can just make infinite mana with Emery using the two Mox Ambers, and with the extra card in hand, that can just win on its own. Oh wow, C Dasher Octopus, okay. So that doesn't mean they can attack down the card this turn, which is a little bit annoying, but not the end of the world. Okay, Terramander. I mean, they're nowhere near activating that, thankfully. Only one instant in the grave. Okay, so they attack Khan with both creatures, which is fine. Like, I'm kind of glad they didn't get a card draw off that. Okay, Briefcase is interesting. So, I think I'm going to leave them Paradox Engine here because I would like to keep the ability to pay an extra mana off the Moonsnare prototype in case they are running Sense or something. I want to keep Emery untapped there. And then we'll play Emery to untap the stuff with Engine, and then we can just play Khan and hopefully win the game. Because we can... Ah, okay. Unfortunately, I have Brazen Bar. I was going to say, we have four mana there between Mox Amber, Moonsnare prototype, we could tap down the Paradox Engine to produce a mana, and then we've got two green off the Lana World, so that would allow us to do the the Khan Ancestral Statue Loop, had they not had the Brazen Borrower there. So we're still good for the loop this turn. I think we have to leave uh, lead on the engine here. Ha, okay, that's a bit unfortunate. I mean, thankfully we still have Emery in place, so we can get Paradox Engine back from the graveyard next turn. So we could play the Briefcase here. Uh, but I think it's probably slightly better to get Mox Samba back first. And then if the briefcase does resolve, we then have access to two mana going into the opponent's turn. Now, I can't... I mean, I can't think of anything where having two mana during the opponent's turn would actually really matter that much, but I think it's slightly more optimal to do it this way around. Because then we still have access to the mana off Moonsnare prototype by tapping the citizen token. So the goal here is to just survive till next turn, which we should do, and then Emery back the Paradox Engine. Oh, okay, they've got another Brazen Warrior to bounce the Emery. So that slows our plan plans down by another turn, which could be pretty bad. So they're going to, what, they're going to be drawing two extra cards this turn. We're not going to be able to get Paradox Engine back from the graveyard. I mean, we could play Khan, but we've already used our Wish to get Paradox Engine. We really just need to get Engine in play, so I think we have to play Emery here. Okay, Breeding Pool, we don't want to play that and shock ourselves because that could very easily mean the opponent could just kill us. You know, that could uh, increase the clock, well, decrease the clock from two turns to one turn if we're not careful. So we're definitely going to lead on Emery here because we want to be able to get back Engine next turn. And I played the Emery first there because now we can activate Mox Amber for mana. Uh, so we'll play Storm the Festival here, and we'll tap down, I think we'll tap down the Emery here, and then we still have a mana in case they have a sensor to pay using the briefcase here. Okay. So that's a bit unfortunate, they do counter the Storm the Festival, but we do have Emery back in play now, so if we can survive this turn, and we can get back Paradox Engine, we can still combo off because we have just enough mana to play Khan. But they are going to be drawing an extra two uh, cards this turn if they attack. Oh, now with Curious Obsession they're going to be drawing three cards, so this is going to be tight. We've just got to hope they don't top deck well here. Okay. Oh wow, okay, I mean that's a pretty good draw now because we can now play the Paradox Engine from hand, which will mean we can then use the Emery activation to untap it, and we have enough mana to play around Lookout's Dispersal.
okay, well, I mean, we can play for that. Just got to hope they don't have another counter spell here. Okay, so now we can get back the Mox Amber. Oh, I th oh, that's so annoying. I think we could have played around that as well. If we'd have activated the Emery before, we could have had Mox Amber available and we'd have had priority after Paradox Engine. So yeah, I think we misplayed there. Okay, so we're going second here. And yeah, I mean, this hand looks pretty sick. We've got... Amber and Kinnon, we've got Moonsnare and Emery. If we can draw a second untapped land, we can go off on turn two. Uh, so we can lead on the prototype to even if we don't draw a second. Oh, well, we did. I was going to say, even if we didn't draw a second untapped land, we've still got Florahedron to play as a land. But now we can potentially go Poseidon, Mox Amber, Kinnon, and then also play Emery and Florahedron in the same turn. Okay, reality chip. Okay, so now we can go Amber, Kinnon. Now Amber and Moonsnare prototype produce four mana between them. So we'll lead on the Emery here. And now we can also cast reality chip off the Moonsnare prototype and still have a mana spare. So, I mean, that was a pretty sick turn too, not going to lie. And with Paradox Engine in hand, we could actually potentially be looking to go off next turn, depending on what we draw here. Well, we know what we're going to draw, but depending on what's on top of the deck, I mean. Okay, so. We'll tap the reality chip to the Moonsnow prototype. We'll tap the amber and play Paradox Engine. And then... Oh, well, we... Surely we just have infinite mana here then, right? Because... It's not a line I normally go for, but you can just loop Reality Chip from the graveyard over and over again because of the legend rule. Uh, hold on, let me just check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was just going to see if there's anything else in the graveyard that we could have got that was better, but I think we're just interested in just looping Reality Chips here because we're netting, what, two mana every single time we do this. And since Mox Amber can produce both green and blue because of the Kinnon, we can now basically just produce infinite mana and we can either uh, reconfigure the reality chip or just keep pumping mana into Kinnon. But if, if we reconfigure the reality chip with infinite mana and Kinnon in play, we can basically just go through our entire deck uh, if we hit lands on top of the deck that we can't cast or we can't play, we can just pump mana into Kinnon to get them off the top, and then we just keep going off with Reality Chip until we hit a Khan. So we should. This looks like another turn three win here, which is pretty crazy. So we'll just keep looping the Reality Chips. We'll start making green mana here so that we can either cast Storm the Festival off the top once we've reconfigured, or start pumping mana into Kinnon as well. So we'll reconfigure the reality chip now, we'll put it on the Florahedron, and I think we'll just play Storm the Festival off the top now. Okay, so we hit a prototype and a land. No point in putting another Emery into play here, really. And another land on top. So, I mean, I think, you know, we're just going to keep looping reality chip here, and we can either just pump the mana into Kinnon, in order to get the land off the top or we can pump the mana into storm the festival uh, to flash that back uh, keep this reality chip here so we should win here we're just digging for Khan basically if we hit lands on top we can just pump mana into Kinnon to get the land off the top uh, just put a Florahedron into play here play reality chip off the top oh wow okay there's the Khan sweet so we should win here then um, so we'll tap amber we'll tap the prototypes and we'll play Khan and now we have more than enough mana to just do the Khan loop uh, the Khan ancestral statue loop and just win the game here then so we grab the statue tap the amber tap the prototype tap the prototype 
Now we'll play the statue, we'll bounce Khan back to our hand. Activate the prototypes. Activate the amber. Play the Khan again. And then we'll grab Portal of Sanctuary. Use the prototypes. Tap the amber, play the Portal of Sanctuary. Now we can just return this statue back to our hand. Activate the prototypes again. Activate the amber again. Play the statue, bouncing the Khan. And now we can just go for the reservoir off the Khan. So yeah, that was pretty sick. Another turn three win here then by the looks of it. So we'll minus the Khan here. Get the reservoir. Activate the prototypes. Activate the amber. Play the reservoir and then I imagine the statue shouldn't take too many activations to get us above 50 life because we have played a lot of different cards this turn, you know. Even just looping the reality chip with Emery added up. Yeah, 19 off the first one. So we should only need a couple then. So we'll activate the prototypes, activate the amber, play the statue, and yeah, sweet. Okay, we're over 50 life already. Nice, we got there.